Well, good afternoon, all. Happy 2022 to each of you. Uh, hopefully, we'll have a better year than we had last year, although last year was pretty good, relatively speaking. Um, I'm continuing on with our lecture series uh, for spinal cord injury. Today, we're going to be talking about respiratory dysfunction. Maybe a thumbs up just to let me know that you're uh, hearing and seeing me okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> with that, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. We're going to be talking through the neurophysiological basis for respiratory care and spinal cord injury, uh, particularly with regard to the pathophysiology that leads to neurogenic restrictive and neurogenic obstructive lung disease. We'll talk through secretion management um, and then ventilator settings, particularly uh, with regard to a weaning protocol. And then we'll talk through a little bit about uh, the incidence and management of sleep apnea after spinal cord injury as well as uh, diaphragmatic pacing. So respiratory guidelines for spinal cord injury uh, came out from the PVA consortium guidelines, the cl clinical practice guidelines in 2005, and essentially addressed the initial assessment of acute spinal cord injury, um, how to prevent and treat atelectasis and pneumonia after spinal cord injury, uh, mechanical ventilation uh, settings and their influence on surfactant, PEEP, and atelectasis, as well as uh, prevention of complications, both uh, short-term and long-term. Uh, they also provide uh, very specific information about ventilator weaning and electrophrenic respiration. Um, we're gonna talk through a little bit of how that has been uh, moved on to not uh, just the phrenic nerve stimulation, but to that actual diaphragm stimulation. Um, the guidelines also considered sleep disordered breathing, and we'll discuss that briefly, but there are also issues related to dysphagia, aspiration, psychosocial adjustments, um, and discharge planning. So um, at about the same time these guidelines came out in the United States, the um, uh, SCIRE, uh, that's the Spinal Cord Injury Rehabilitation Evidence Guidelines, came out from the International Collaboration on Repair Discoveries. Um, and so chapter eight of the uh, SCIRE guidelines uh, provided information on exercise and inspiratory muscle training, uh, pharmaceutical interventions, assistive devices, also obstructive sleep apnea and then secretion removal. So they came out essentially uh, back to back and uh, really were very much uh, in concert with the recommendations that were there. So let's talk through the muscles of uh, respiration. This is supposed to be somewhat inspirational. Um, inspirational uh, muscles include the diaphragm and internal intercostal muscles. Those are the primary active muscles of inspiration. Recognize that we also have accessory muscles of inspiration. Those include the sternocleidomastoid, the trapezius, and the scalenes. Um, uh, expiration is... Uh, primarily a passive process, that is relaxation of the diaphragm and intercostal muscles, um, but to have uh, active uh, uh, expiration requires um, basically activation of the rectus abdominis, transverse abdominis, and internal external obliques. Those are uh, innervated from the thoracic uh, cord, and so individuals who have high thoracic and or cervical injuries um, won't have those uh, muscles uh, available to assist with coughing, for example. We'll talk through more of that um, in the next few slides. So basically breathing mechanics, uh, this, is, this is kind of a bell jar application, recognizing that um, uh, we look at the diaphragm at rest, its resting length is uh, somewhat domed. Um, so that when it contracts, uh, as we talk through inspiration, diaphragm contracts, the intercostal muscles elevate the ribs, um, and that changes the, uh, the, the atmospheric pressure uh, within the thoracic space so that ultimately we see an inflow of air coming into that. Expiration is the opposite. So we talked about um, relaxation of the diaphragm and intercostal muscles. Um, in order to generate a, a positive pressure, uh, we would also have to activate the abdominal muscles as we discussed previously. So I, I just wanna take a moment and review um, the diaphragm excursion. Remember the diaphragm is domed somewhat um, at its resting length. And so under uh, normal conditions then, when we contract the diaphragm, we have a fairly 
um, good tidal volume. Um, however, if you have paralyzed abdominal muscles, uh, then recognize that the diaphragm is no longer in its domed, but in a somewhat flattened position. And it's from that position uh, that the individual is going to inspire. As they inspire, the tidal volume is going to be markedly diminished. And in order to meet um, uh, respiratory needs, basically the person is going to have to breathe uh, much faster in order to compensate for a reduced tidal volume. Now we can employ the use of a very expensive and technologically advanced device called an abdominal binder. Um, by using this uh, binder, we uh, basically press the abdominal contents back in and up uh, against the diaphragm, restoring its resting length essentially, um, so that uh, essentially we can recover the tidal volume simply by using this less than $20 uh, appliance. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of times we see um, either it's not employed or uh, the patients uh, choose not to use it. So we'll continue to try to encourage its use even after the initial uh, rehabilitation efforts. Um, so I mentioned earlier neurogenic restrictive lung disease. Uh, this is again, because the uh, person has um, uh, the inability to expand completely the uh, thoracic space, uh, either by uh, diminished uh, use of the intercostal muscles and or the diaphragm or the combination thereof. So uh, restrictive lung disease, you'll remember, um, is characterized by a low vital capacity a reduced total lung capacity with very shallow breathing. We call tachypnea the rapid uh, shallow breathing. And then pulmonary compliance is diminished. Uh, so the work of breathing actually appears to be greater. Uh, the elastic work of breathing is greater than uh, you would have expected otherwise. Other examples of restrictive lung disease, including uh, scoliosis, obesity, obstructive apnea, um, muscular dystrophies and um, uh, ALS or motor neuron disease. So let's go back for a moment and just recall what we've learned about the um, spinal cord injury. Remember the central nervous system is comprised of the brain and the cord. When we look at the somatic nervous system uh, arising from the cord, we have different myotomes and those different myotomes have different levels um, depending upon the spinal cord injury at which uh, you have um, paralysis of different muscles. So a high spinal cord injury, for example, um, just below C5 um, would allow some use of the elbow flexors, but nothing below that uh, on this chart. Um, the uh, central nervous system is um, basically also the host uh, of the autonomic nervous system. They, they join uh, processes um, through the parasympathetic nervous system, which includes the cranial nerves uh, coming off of midbrain and medulla, as well as the sacral nerves. And then the sympathetic nervous system arises from the thoracal lumbar regions of the cord. Um, and so that said, as we look at uh, the usual process for sympathetic nervous system activation of fight and flight, we would see sympathetic um, uh, activation causing bronchodilation and a reduction in um, mucus secretion. Um, this is the fight or flight syndrome um, associated with a need to either fight or flee. Um, the parasympathetic nervous system, you'll recall, is kind of the rest and digest uh, component after a crisis situation has been taken care of by the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system um, increases its activation to uh, convey energy conservation. Um, now, with regard to the pulmonary uh, system, we see a constriction of the uh, bronchi under parasympathetic influence, as well as increased mucus secretion. So, um, part of what we are dealing with after spinal cord injury, in addition to the restrictive lung disease, is a neurogenic obstructive lung disease. Um, and this essentially has to do with the parasympathetic dominance uh, over the sympathetic nervous system, which is blunted um, after a spinal cord injury. Uh, 
so that we do see an increase in bronchial or constriction and mucus secretion, essentially unopposed obstructive lung disease, um, as reported by Shalero back in 2018. So this uh, is essentially what contributes to the neurogenic obstructive lung disease. And again, um, most of the time we see folks with the spinal cord injury, most of the time they're young men, you all know that, the high testosterone levels, et cetera. Um, and we don't typically think of uh, restrictive or obstructive lung disease in this population. However, the nervous system changes and particularly the parasympathetic dominance and the somatic dysfunction contribute to respectively obstructive and restrictive lung disease. So mucus, mucus is our buddy and our pal if we have the ability to clear uh, mucus out of the airways. Mucus is that colloidal suspension of water and a number of proteins, glycoproteins, proteoglycans, and lipids. Um, basically, this is very sticky, and the great news is that it will catch uh, debris from the peripheral to the central airways, uh, moving along, assuming that the person can cough and sympathetically activate bronchiolar dilation. After high spinal cord injury, however, we simply aren't able to clear mucus. So we end up with these tight pipes with lots of gunk in them and mucus plugging is one of our major issues that we have to worry about. Um, a recent admission to our spinal cord injury service from the ICU demonstrated that in a matter of hours, uh, basically, an individual, uh, and this person had C6, uh, complete spinal cord injury, came over and within 12 hours had basically developed a mucus plug. And um, his, uh, his inspiration, his aeration was diminished uh, markedly and we had to transport him back to the ICU. Part of this could have been prevented by um, more optimally managing uh, mucus secretions. And so we're gonna be talking, I'm gonna spend a lot of time uh, talking about how to manage this. Um, we know that uh, deep tracheal suction uh, is going to be important in part of this, and so we need to make sure that our nurses are, are doing that as well, using bronchodilators appropriately, and um, uh, recognize that atrovent, ipratropium bromide, basically provides parasympathetic blockade as well as increases surfactant. We'll talk about surfactant a little bit more in a few minutes. Uh, we can use the theophylines, although we do worry about uh, toxicity associated with that. Um, but really, we need to also administer agents to break down mucus, to thin the mucus, um, and then to remove it. Um, hopefully, by doing prevention, we don't have to move forward with uh, bronchoscopies and, and while our pulmonary co colleagues do very much enjoy doing bronchoscopies for, for mucus secretion, it's a very uh, satisfying procedure. Our patients don't appreciate it so much. Um, and so whatever we can do to prevent this kind of a scenario, we should be doing. And so we'll be talking through that. Um, the use of bronchodilators and spinal cord injury have been uh, really propagated over the, the 90s and, and uh, beyond. Uh, a number of studies have demonstrated significant um, uh, airway hyperreactivity um, in persons with spinal cord injury, particularly tetraplegia, um, where we see somewhere around 50% of individuals having hyperreactivity to uh, any changes in the airway, that is because they don't have much in the way of a sympathetic influence to counteract any parasympathetic uh, uh, activity that's activated. Um, so uh, basically, I, I recommend a combination of um, uh, ipratropium bromide as well as albuterol duonebs, uh, basically to help uh, dilate the airways, um, but as well to um, moisten secretions that will be there as well. Um, we can use oscillation devices or use uh, manual postural percussion and drainage to then shake those um, mucus secretions loose from the airways and allow for uh, removal. Um, and again, a number of different ways we can do this. Uh, we used to employ the quad cough uh, significantly. Uh, that uh, was essentially eliminated or contraindicated uh, 
um, again, around the, the late 80s, early 90s, as they started using the uh, uh, inferior vena cable filters, uh, those, those were used primarily to prevent uh, thrombus uh, to becoming pulmonary emboli. And, and while that was good, um, what they found is if they used the cough assist, which is essentially a Heimlich type of maneuver for a person uh, lying supine in bed who has a spinal cord injury, the nurse would do an assisted cough, but that cough could also displace the inferior vena cable filter, um, causing significant migration and potentially uh, perforation of the inferior vena cava and um, exsanguination, which would be suboptimal. So um, now we have available to us mechanical inexsufflation. It's actually been available for several decades, um, but not, uh, not all centers have uh, fully implemented its use. So I want to kind of talk through a little bit of how a uh, cough assist mechanical inexsufflation device works. Oh, and I just missed it. Let's go back one. How cough assist works. Cough assist simulates a cough through mechanical insufflation exsufflation. The device gradually applies positive pressure to the airway. This expands the lungs in the same manner as a normal deep breath. Cough assist then rapidly shifts to negative pressure. This produces a high expiratory flow from the lungs and effectively removes mucus. Each change from positive to negative pressure replicates a cough cycle. A series of cycles provides a full treatment. So we are making recommendations for our uh, residents to implement a, a respiratory management protocol around the clock as patients come over uh, from the ICU to the rehab unit. Um, and ideally, these three maneuvers are going to be um, all uh, included within a 30-minute period. Um, so nebulizer treatment, as I mentioned, using duo neps, uh, which includes albuterol, ipotropium, bromide, initially every four hours, extending to every six hours, then every eight hours. Um, this is followed immediately by postural percussion and drainage and or vibration um, to break the secretions loose from the airways. Um, and that is followed immediately by mechanical and exsufflation. That's necessary to clear the mucus, the, uh, the thinned mucus that has been broken uh, away from the airways. Um, and basically we can use this, um, uh, we'll titrate initially from 20, uh, 20 that's 20 um, millimeters of mercury uh, or, or centimeters of water um, actually for inspiration and 20 centimeters of water for expiration. We're going to titrate that up to 40 and 40. Those clinicians if, uh, who, are, who are watching this, if you haven't done this, um, I would encourage you to try this on yourself so that you can see how effectively uh, this can be. And we just recently reported this out again in this uh, protocol um, in a recent 2020 uh, publication. Now, I want to talk a little bit about ventilator modes. Uh, we have two major modes for uh, mechanical ventilation. One is assist control, and the other is uh, synchronous intermittent mandatory ventilation. Um, my um, recommendation follows those recommendations of the consortium guidelines in that the assist control ventilation ideally uh, used will improve the likelihood that a person can be weaned off a ventilator. Um, so essentially, uh, we, we look at these guidelines. Uh, they use work that had come from uh, Peterson way back in the 1990s out of uh, Craig Hospital in Denver, um, essentially showing that assistive control or assist control progressive ventilator free breathing um, is going to allow significantly um, greater likelihood the person will be able to wean off a ventilator. Um, as opposed to the SIMB mode where the person really, uh, this prolongs the weaning process. They don't get a, uh, a rest period uh, when this uh, type of uh, ventilator mode is used. And, and again, remember that their anabolic potential has significantly diminished after spinal cord injury. So they simply are not um, resting sufficiently to uh, strengthen the diaphragm uh, and intercostal muscles as we go through this. So uh, again, the Peterson protocol um, recommends uh, 
the um, assist control mode um, and basically using um, uh, settings somewhere between a tidal volume of 15 to 20 cc's per kilo uh, per ideal body weight. Now, uh, the, the issue is our, our pulmonology uh, colleagues uh, have great concern about these types of tidal volumes because they've been um, linked with acute respiratory distress syndrome. I'll, I'll talk through that in just, uh, just another slide or two. Um, what we found um, when we did this with spinal cord injury patients, however, um, Peterson, uh, their protocol basically included 42 individuals with C3 or C4 uh, motor complete tetraplegia, um, and they had two modes. They had a high tidal volume, which was between 20 and 30 cc's per kilo, um, and a low tidal volume uh, between essentially 11 and 20 cc's uh, per kilo. What they found was those individuals with tetraplegia on the high tidal volumes um, were able to wean off a ventilator within 37 days on average. Um, only 16% of them developed atelectasis, two developed pneumonia, and none of them, what? None of them developed acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, as opposed to those individuals that were randomized to the low tidal volume, and again, this was between 11 and 20 cc's per kilo, took almost twice as, uh, as many days to wean. 50% um, of them developed atelectasis, which contributed to the longer wean time. Six developed pneumonia, and one of them developed acute respiratory distress syndrome. So I keep mentioning this ARDS. Uh, so let's talk through that a little bit. Um, this is essentially related to parenchymal damage, reducing the gas exchange, uh, and it carries a mortality of up to 50% which is obviously suboptimal. Ware and Matthew uh, reported out in 2000 in the New England Journal of Medicine that uh, ARDS was tied with high tidal volumes. And they felt that this was because of volutrauma um, damaging the alveoli and subsequently causing a release of cytokines and inflammatory cells uh, that um, ultimately led to uh, ARDS and 50% uh, of the time the patient's demise. Now, uh, six years later, Cal reported out, wait a minute, before we get too uh, set on this, recognize that the work of breathing is inversely proportioned to the tidal volumes. This, this was non-spinal cord injured adults. Now, what does that mean? Um, the higher the tidal volumes, uh, ultimately the less the work of breathing as the person was trying to wean off a ventilator. Um, so uh, again, when we look at Fenton's uh, work, and this uh, was related to spinal cord injury, they had um, 33 individuals uh, and uh, they were randomized to, to two different groups. Now, part, part of the issue here was they didn't actually see uh, an improvement in the median days to wean, 14 and a half days in the group uh, with the relatively high tidal volumes, 14 days uh, in the group with relatively low tidal volumes. And part of this was because they uh, powered the analysis for a sample size of, of 70, and they, they didn't even get halfway there. Um, so what they did find was that um, there, this was a safe uh, protocol. In other words, there was no difference in um, the safety outcomes, uh, atelectasis or pneumonia or ARDS, um, and, and so using higher tidal volumes uh, is safe. Is it effective? At least by this study, uh, they weren't able to show that. Although uh, Peterson's work also out of Craig uh, years earlier had showed that there was benefit to it. Now there was a recent uh, publication that came out of uh, Tier in Houston um, and they looked at high tidal volume uh, compared to low tidal volume with regards to ventilator associated pneumonias in acute spinal cord injury. Now, a couple of flaws with this uh, study. Um, let's first start talking through the acronyms. So um, STV is standard tidal volumes, uh, and you're gonna see that those standard tidal volumes uh, were significantly lower than what we had talked about with Peterson's articles. The, in this study, they considered standard tidal volumes between uh, essentially seven and nine cc's per kilo which was well below the uh, 
low tidal volumes uh, that had been trialed by Peterson in, in the previous study. In this study, they called the high tidal volumes those between 10 and 11, essentially, uh, which is, again, relatively low tidal volumes from our perspective. Um, and what they found was that in this cohort of 181 individuals, 159 of them were in the standard tidal volume and only 22. This was not a randomized study. This was a study of convenience, essentially. Um, and so when we take a look at those 22 that were provided the high tidal volumes, uh, recognize that's a significant difference. Uh, and the relatively high tidal volumes weren't all that greater than what would have been expected. So you've got that unequal number. You've got a span of individuals between C1 and C7 tetraplegia, um, and then uh, additional issues. So those uh, with Asia impairment scale A, that is complete spinal cord injury, 73% uh, of those were listed on the high tidal volume group, um, and 86% uh, of them had, uh, had trachs. So it, essentially, um, we're running into problems with the way the study was put together, um, and they didn't describe secretion management. So ideally, it would have included what we've talked about before, dual NEBS every four to six hours post uh, uh, postural percussion and drainage and then mechanical and exsufflation. But they didn't describe this at all uh, in their protocol uh, and in the manuscript. So we really don't know that high tidal volumes as, as uh, initially reported out at Craig um, is associated with ventilator associated uh, pneumonias uh, in acute spinal cord injury. So we need, we need to replicate, I think, the study from um, the 1990s that was trialed again by Fenton's group um, at Craig uh, more than a decade ago and see if this is actually true or not. We have that opportunity uh, available to us. The bottom line is mechanical ventilation, um, tidal volumes, those with high volumes have reduced atelectasis, time to wean, reduced episodes of pneumonia, pleural effusion, empyema, trapped lungs, and de decortication. They do, however, have an increased incidence of pneumothorax, and that needs to be uh, considered um, as you are trying to wean these folks off a ventilator. So the, the recommended uh, vent management uh, from the uh, consortium clinical practice guidelines uh, basically looks like this. Uh, we determine the ideal body weight as reported here, and then use the vent settings that are also listed here, uh, assist control with high tidal volumes, 15 to 20 cc's per kilo. Um, and if the person has a low tidal volume on admission, increase the tidal volumes by 100 cc's per day until you achieve that target goal. Um, you wanna have a respiratory rate of 12. Um, I won't go into the sigh and flow rate at this point, um, but we do want to make sure that we minimize the dead space. So the tubing uh, can't be too long or basically you're not moving fresh or new air uh, into uh, the person's lungs. Um, there are limits that are recommended by these guidelines as well, keeping peak pressures below 40 centimeters of water, um, keeping the tidal volumes less than 25 cc's per kilo, um, and, um, and then again, as we talked about, if you're going to increase the tidal volume, uh, increase that by 100 cc's per day until you reach that goal. Um, so these are, are the recommendations. Um, are they being employed uh, across the country? Pro probably not, um, is, is what we're finding, at least by recent literature. Um, this is a vent weaning checklist that I would encourage you to consider um, using. You would like to see a person's vital capacity greater than 10 cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight, um, and their tidal volumes uh, more than 15 cc's per kilo. Their maximal inspiratory pressure should be greater than 20 and maximal expiratory pressure greater than 20. Um, respiratory rate, obviously, or maybe not so obviously, should be less than 30. Um, minute ventilation should be less than 10 liters, um, and ideally they can double that. Um, and then we want to optimize these uh, things and make sure that the person is ready to go through the wean process. Um, again, Peterson reported out uh, in the early 90s, uh, basically uh, vent weaning should be done uh, 
uh, in a supine position, or if they're gonna be upright, uh, they should have an abdominal binder. Um, and this is one of the major um, issues that I've seen in several institutions that I've practiced at. Uh, folks just forget to use the abdominal binder. Um, and again, relatively inexpensive, but uh, significantly improves the ability for the person to wean off a ventilator. Um, as well as using assist control, progressive ventilator free breathing. So using a T piece, uh, a T -piece with low airway resistance. Um, basically, you see success more than two thirds of the time in the assist control as opposed to the to SIMB mode, only about a third of those successfully wean off. Now, poor prognostic indicators, those individuals uh, with injuries above C4. So C4 is kind of my cutoff. Um, more than two thirds of folks with C4 spinal cord injury should be able to wean off of a ventilator. Um, those with C3, um, less than 50% um, and probably less than a third. Um, Individuals over the age of 50 with a vital capacity of less than a liter um, are likely not going to be able to wean. Um, and so kind of keep these things in mind as we talk through the weaning process. The other thing that happens um, in, uh, in our folks that leads to a failure to wean is we try to advance too quickly. Um, and so with able-bodied individuals, you can take them off an hour uh, one day, a couple hours the next day, and they move forward relatively quickly. Our folks uh, simply can't do that. And so we need to be more slow, more intentional with the weaning process. Um, so um, obviously the same things, making sure a chest x-ray is clear, uh, the patient agrees to wean, they understand the process. And then we do the wean with the uh, trach cuff down, trach talk uh, as tolerated. Um, and uh, two minutes, three times a day for the first one to three days, and then progress on to five minutes, three times a day, 10 minutes, three times a day, 20 minutes, three times a day. Um, on down, you'll see this process until the person is off a ventilator for um, at least 48 hours without distress. Now you can increase the time uh, a maximum of two steps. So I, uh, if the person did really well on two minutes, I might jump to 10 minutes three times a day after the first day, um, but um, we don't want to over fatigue them. Re recognize that the, the diaphragm, skeletal muscle, the diaphragm becomes paper thin after uh, two or three weeks of mechanical ventilation for a person in spinal cord injury. You don't see that kind of atrophy occurring in able-bodied individuals. And part of that is um, because the, they are somewhat paralyzed now and they can't activate uh, completely nor do they have the anabolic potential that a person without a spinal cord injury has. So uh, it's a different beast uh, uh, weaning from a spinal cord injury than an able-bodied individual. Um, so we talked about the wean protocol, discontinue the wean if you have uh, two or more of the below. If the respiratory rate is increasing to 35, uh, breaths per minute, um, if you see a, a, a rapid change in heart rate or blood pressure, if they're not maintaining their oxygen saturation, um, if they're having problems with spasm, diaphoresis, obviously mental status changes, and or they report uh, dyspnea and fatigue, then you want to hold the wean uh, and look back at the process. What has changed? Why is the individual not able to progress? Um, and so basically you go back to those previous things that we had discussed uh, just to make sure that all of this is, is still uh, a go. Um, now, um, I want to also uh, just briefly talk about tracheostomy and, and trach management. Um, obviously our folks who are on mechanical ventilators for a significant amount of time, we worry about barotrauma. Um, and so we consider using a, a trach early on. Um, I wanna make a case for using a cuffless system as soon as possible, um, recognizing that a, uh, a cuffed trach, uh, sometimes we think that's preventing aspiration, but anytime you let that cuff down, whatever sits just above that is likely to dislodge and go forward and still cause aspiration. So um, I guess first off, don't, don't fool yourself into thinking that that cuff is going to be protective at all the times because it, it's not. 
I think the other thing is that we um, want to optimize the person's ability to talk. And if they've got a trach, they can't pass air through the larynx and therefore they can't vocalize or phonate. Um, and so in order for them to vocalize, um, we provide a passing newer valve. This is a one-way um, valve that allows air to come in, uh, but, uh, but then closes. And so as uh, air is expired through this valve that is placed here, or basically here, uh, the air is, is forced to go back up through the normal uh, airways um, and uh, pass through the trachea. So a person can take a deep breath, and then speak in between voices as they are uh, collecting air and passing the air up through the vocal folds. Um, the advantages of this um, uh, also uh, allows vocalization, reduces the risk of aspiration, and restores the natural peep uh, that we would love to attain in persons with spinal cord injury. Now, Cuff deflation. Uh, the person came to us on a, on, on a cuffed trach. What are we going to do about that? Um, so first off, we want to make sure that they don't have aspiration problems, that they can eat without difficulty. Um, speech therapists is in, in uh, concurrence with the physicians and nursing staff. The patient agrees to proceed, and the chest x-ray is clear. Um, now, we want to make sure that as we do this process, um, as we let the cuff down, this, this is huge. As you let the cuff down and you don't change the tidal volume, basically you've reduced the air that the person is going because of blow by. And so when you let that cuff down, you also need to increase the tidal volume settings on the machine, um, 100 to 400 cc's and uh, compensate for that air leak now that you've created by letting the cuff down. Um, this is uh, probably the, the major impediment uh, that I've found in the ICU setting uh, for folks to progress. Uh, you, you drop the cuff and then they aren't getting as much fresh air as they were getting before. And this is anxiety provoking as it would be for you or I. So recognize that as you drop that, that cuff, you need to increase the tidal volumes to give them that sense of, oh, I'm still okay with this. Um, so um, changing to the cuffless trach uh, when the person has had the cuff uh, deflated for 48 hours without distress is appropriate. Um, and then similarly, you're gonna be looking to discontinue this cuff deflation process um, if you start to have problems uh, with nausea, GI upset, uh, et cetera. Um, so decannulation for spinal cord injury. Um, uh, John Bach out of Kessler uh, has written a lot on neuromuscular disease and um, uh, weaning protocols uh, for persons with uh, neuromuscular disease, spinal cord injury, et cetera, um, and uh, really is an advocate for decannulation, recognizing that a lot of times the trach itself can interfere with swallowing. Um, and uh, so... Uh, because of the irritation associated with the trach itself and, and the usual process, uh, Bach, among others, uh, advocates uh, giving the person a trial to decannulate. Uh, Ross and White also reported um, that it, even individuals with spinal cord injury um, who are having aspirations, the trach seemed to be contributing to the aspiration process. So, um, both groups uh, recognize that uh, for successful decannulation, you need to have continuous pulse ox uh, monitoring, PRN suctioning and cough assist, uh, respiratory therapy review every two hours uh, while you're doing this decannulation process and make sure that you have a spare trait and a trait dilator at the bedside. Now, I know we have our, our respiratory uh, therapy chief um, on the call at the moment. I think that he he would agree that um, the best time to do a, a decannulation is not on a Friday afternoon just before sign out. The best time to do this is early in the week, early in the day after the whole team has agreed um, that this is going to be a process and then we have these things available just in case as we move forward. So the decannulation process then on a Monday morning, 
um, or Tuesday morning, I'll, I'll give that much, um, would include the, uh, these eligibility criteria. You want to have a negative sputum culture, clear chest x-ray, person is able to get in and out of bed, um, that is, uh, with assistance. Um, there are no pending procedures. We're not pressed to extubate or aspiration. So um, basically five of those six need to be in play before we would move forward with this. And then the protocol that we like to use involves early morning um, decannulation with continuous pulse oximetry uh, monitoring, checking hourly uh, to see if they need mechanical inexufflation. They may generate, as you remove this, you may have more secretions. Um, you're gonna have a respiratory therapist monitor every two hours. Um, and as we said before, the spare trach uh, at the bedside with trach dilator, just in case. Why decannulate? The person is safe you know, with the trach in place, except that there in, is an increased risk of stromal uh, uh, infection, of tracheal injuries, uh, a, a mucus plug, interruption of the glottal and subglottal airflow, dysphagia, and then impaired communication. These are all reasons why I would prefer decannulate uh, whenever possible. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. How am I doing on time? Um, I want to talk about uh, airway positive pressure. Um, so this is the use of continuous positive airway pressure, CPAP, um, and or BiPAP, which is bi-level positive airway pressure. The, uh, the difference between them is that the BiPAP uh, allows for a, a greater span, providing better inspiratory muscle support as we go through here. This is Rodin's The Thinker using his uh, CPAP device um, as, uh, well, think about it. We'll, we'll come through that in a moment. How do you know a person has sleep apnea? Well, uh, first off, what is the definition? Sleep apnea means that you stop breathing while, while you sleep. That's, um, oh, suboptimal. Uh, this is because of the closure of both oral and nasal airways. And so the typical symptoms, irregular breathing or snoring, daytime sleepiness, memory or concentration problems, often waking up during the night uh, and particularly feeling uh, uh, very anxious when you do that, and then waking up tired or with a headache. Now, remember, um, your first thought when a person uh, with high spinal cord injury reports a headache in the morning is probably autonomic dysreflexia associated with a distended bladder. But your second thought should be, once you've ruled that out, should be, um, is the person having problems with sleep apnea? Um, and our folks with spinal cord injury have this to a significantly greater extent than able-bodied population. So essentially, obstructive sleep apnea basically means that you've blocked all airways um, and therefore your, the blood, which the heart continues to pump, is not oxygenated, you're not getting that full oxygenation, particularly to the brain, which is gonna be causing problems. And we know now that uh, sleep apnea is related to a significant cognitive dysfunction uh, as the person ages. So um, we know that uh, for persons with spinal cord injury, including paraplegia, um, we see a great, uh, a much greater uh, extent of sleep apnea um, than we do in the able-bodied population. And, um, you know, this is, depending upon what you're reading, uh, up to 60% uh, of persons with spinal cord injury, even paraplegia, uh, will have this. And, it, and it's thought partly because of the paralyzed abdominal musculature, partly because of, oh, have I ever mentioned obesity after spinal cord injury? Um, and the way that that contributes to uh, sleep apnea as well. So management of sleep apnea, um, basically providing positive pressure. When you use this type of a mask, you have to uh, make that very, very firm. That is, you have to um, have a very tight seal across there. When that seal is going over the bridge of the nose, it often will cause a bruise and or pressure injury. Uh, and after that first night, the person never wants to wear it again. I would recommend that if we're going to be rec uh, recommending um, CPAP or BiPAP to our folks that we use this type of a device. It has a mouthpiece and nasal trumpets and notice no pressure injuries associated with this. So the uh, compliance with this device is about 90%, uh, I'm sorry, is about 10%, even in the able-bodied population with this device, about 90%. Um, and so why start with additional problems when we don't need to? So that's, that's something we can talk about a little bit later. Um, great movie, if you haven't seen it, uh, gives uh, Christopher Reeve 
an opportunity to really demonstrate what goes on with a person with spinal cord injury. Um, if their ventilator stops, what? His ventilator stopped. And so he died. And no, 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 he didn't die in the middle of the movie. Um, he ended up using glossopharyngeal breathing, frog breathing uh, for two minutes. And I tell you, it's exhausting just to watch this. Hollywood got it right and showed the, uh, the resilience of, of folks with spinal cord injury, but only if they know how to do this frog breathing. So anybody that I'm gonna send home on a ventilator, I do wanna make sure that we've taught them how to gulp air uh, uh, using this glossopharyngeal breathing process. And I don't have time to go into it in detail, but it's available on YouTube. You can take a look. Um, basically gulping air until such time as you can reestablish a mechanical ventilator. A um, couple of thoughts with regard to vaccinations, pneumococcal vaccine, um, at least once, but uh, our guidelines actually recommend every five years for persons with spinal cord injury and then an annual uh, influenza vaccine. Now, I didn't mention COVID and I should. Um, so well, I would have thought that our folks with spinal cord injury are at higher risk for COVID and mortality after COVID um, uh, because of all of the things we just talked about, the neurogenic restrictive obstructive lung disease, et cetera, et cetera. Now the COVID, uh, 19, basically, um, this is uh, uh, also known as severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, so SARS-CoV-2. Uh, um, this is similar to the uh, virus of 2003, and, and again, there was another Middle East respiratory syndrome, coronavirus, another coronavirus, what, in 2012? We didn't hear much about those. Um, but essentially, this is a, uh, this is a, a similar virus uh, uh, kind of on steroids is what we've been told. Um, and the bottom line is uh, the transmission <coughs> is um, probably initially uh, came from bats. What, bats? Yes. Um, and um, ultimately what we know is that this virus uh, uses the angiotensin converting enzyme system to infect humans. Um, now, uh, the common clinical findings, most of us should know this fever, cough, shortness of breath, and then uh, severe symptoms in, in included here. Um, I think uh, we need to look at the comparison with other pandemics. Um, and so the reproductive rate of the um, COVID-19 virus is greater than that of other viruses. That is, it's more easily transmitted uh, the mortality is skewed for those over the age of uh, 75. Um, hospitalization actually was required more for the previous versions of uh, coronavirus. Um, and um, again, we're seeing different things here uh, and, and we have to keep in mind as we're seeing numbers reported, uh, they were never reported like this previously. And so um, we do know that uh, generally speaking, SARS, uh, uh, or, or the COVID-19 virus has a mortality rate of about 1%. Um, so um, I'm, I'm gonna kind of jump through the all-cause mortality and recognize that we've been sitting just around the same place all-cause mortality has been. Now that means not just viruses, but heart, cancer, et cetera, causes of death um, over the years. And we see uh, this kind of a pattern. I don't have the most recent numbers, but they're elevated compared to what they were previously. I do ask that you keep in mind that um, the 2020 expected deaths uh, for individuals over the 75, we expected to see about one and a half million people die. That's all cause mortality uh, in 2020 and similar numbers a little bit higher um, in 2021. Um, I don't have that data yet. What I do know is that um, about 25 million people in the United States are over the age of 75. Um, and uh, a large number of those have multiple uh, comorbidities. Um, <clears throat> back uh, a year ago, um, 92,000 individuals uh, were over the age of 100. What? Over the age of 100. Um, and currently, we still have more than 95,000 individuals in the United States over the age of 100. Yes, they are at higher risk, I, I get that. But kind of keep this in mind as we're seeing all these numbers, we've really never seen uh, the testing uh, as we're seeing now. Um, and, and that being the case, I, I just don't know um, 
you know, at what point we're going to kind of change back or will we ever change back to pre-COVID-19 um, population uh, management? I, I don't know. Um, what we had recommended for persons with spinal cord injury is that we continue using this respiratory supportive care that we provided. Um, for my folks with high spinal cord injury, most of them I had written a prescription for a um, mechanical and exsufflator and a duoneb machine, taught them how to do postural percussion and drainage. And anytime that they started to have increased secretions, uh, made the recommendation they continue to use these. If they show up to the emergency department, it becomes problematic. Generally speaking, we don't have enough negative pressure rooms to manage this. Um, and our, um, our folks, basically, they're not sure how to do this in the emergency department. Um, most of our spinal cord injury patients won't get this kind of care. Um, we do recognize that there are antiviral agents, there are antibodies now that are being provided. Um, we simply need to uh, consider um, how are we gonna move forward with our person with spinal cord injury. Some data shows that they seem to be at higher risk. Most of the data shows that they're about the same risk um, as able-bodied individuals. And I think the main thing is to remind them, you know, hand washing, using a mask, doing appropriate pulmonary management. Um, yes, get the uh, COVID vaccine um, and, and whether that's Moderna or Pfizer um, or the Johnson & Johnson, I, I don't advocate as much the J&J, &J, but the others um, seem to also benefit from a booster. Uh, so approximately six months after. And maybe we're gonna end up doing this from this point forward, the same as we've done with flu viruses. Um, recognize that when we get a vaccine, the yearly vaccine for the flu virus, that's because the virus changes as does COVID uh, and it mutates. And so the virus that, that, that um, we are vaccinating against this year may be different than the COVID virus next year. And that's why we would probably, and then we'll probably see recommendations for ongoing um, vaccinations. I'm running out of time, so I'll, I wanna just briefly talk about diaphragmatic pacemakers. So as, as we have heart pacemakers, we also have respiratory pacemakers. Um, and these have been around for some time. Um, the uh, first implant in humans was back in 1968 and recognized that this diaphragmatic pacemaker is uh, covered by Medicare Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, reimbursements. Um, for spinal cord injury, we wanna make sure that the person has a viable phrenic nerve. So we're gonna do nerve conduction studies and or EMG of the diaphragm, both sides, before we would implant it. And again, the, uh, the initial uh, device uh, put together by Dobell included cuffs, cuff electrodes around the phrenic nerve uh, with an antenna receiver and a radio transmitter, basically to stimulate uh, contraction of the diaphragm. Um, it's been demonstrated to be very effective um, and 50% uh, of individuals in a multicenter trial way back in 1988 uh, had full support. What does that mean? 24 hours a day they were using the, um, the pacemaker um, and another third uh, achieved significant adjunct support, meaning that they only used the um, ventilator at night. Um, one of these individuals at the time uh, that this came out in 1988 um, had had the implant present for 18 and a half years. Uh, and Graham Creasy reported out uh, benefits. Basically, um, we saw an, an uptick in utilization of uh, diaphragmatic pacemaking uh, with the advent of minimally invasive surgery. So basically they would take the same system, but instead of putting cuff electrodes around the phrenic nerve, they would actually go underneath the diaphragm with minimally invasive surgery um, and implant the electrodes into the diaphragm itself. Um, so using this type of a device, they, um, again, as they do with minimally invasive surgery, blow up uh, the abdomen um, with carbon dioxide and turn on the lights and they are looking up at the diaphragm. Uh, these little red spots you see are in there for, are from uh, suction cup discs where they checked the, um, the activation of motor units and then sewed the, um, uh, the electrodes basically into those points of maximal stimulation. Uh, then they wrapped the wires together 
Um, and uh, nowadays they send the person home the next day. This is done as an outpatient. What? What? Um, well, think about it. Uh, the person is already on a ventilator. And so um, basically they can go home on the ventilator, same settings, and they start to do the weaning process, which is essentially progressive strengthening exercises. And so there is a protocol that they follow as they come through this. So um, anyway, I, I hope that we're gonna be seeing more of this uh, in the future. I know there's at least one surgeon here uh, in the Jackson system who is doing the minimally invasive uh, surgery to provide diaphragmatic stimulation uh, from below. Um, but I don't know how many of these uh, she has implanted over the last couple of years. Maybe um, Mr. Tantalus knows, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and kind of uh, throw this off. This is nothing to sneeze at, but just one of those uh, Dr. Seuss uh, poems to help you remember uh, the importance. Uh, by the way, have you seen a person with spinal cord injury, high spinal cord injury sneeze? What does that even look like? And what kind of pressures are generated? Um, all of that to say, um, I think that we can provide great uh, respiratory care. We need to uh, continue to kind of uh, uh, build on what we've already learned with spinal cord injury management. And I hope that this center uh, will begin to lead the nation in managing uh, respiratory care after spinal cord injury. So number of uh, references, I'm updating this, uh, this lecture even today. Um, as I go through, and so more, more information in the future. Um, any uh, questions? This is an opportunity for you to um, blow off some steam, so to speak. Hey, Dr. Gator. Uh, thanks for the lecture, breathtaking. Um, question about the management uh, with duo NEBS. Is there any benefit to treating uh, some of these patients as you know sort of a COPD picture with a uh, long acting beta antagonist or um, llamas uh, you know kind of for maintenance once they go home yeah that, that's a potential I think that um, you know there's uh, some um, th there are studies that show only in the acute uh, phase um, and or acute interventions but they haven't really looked at long-term uh, success or efficacy. So that would be a nice uh, study to put together uh, to see if those might in the long run help to not just reduce the, the likelihood of atelectasis pneumonia, but also um, potentially improve um, sleep apnea in that, in that type of a scenario. So great thought. Any additional questions, uh, thoughts, concerns? Dr. Uh, Gator? Okay. Yes, there's two, two questions. Go ahead. Let's have a lady go first, yes. Okay. Uh, hi, Dr. Gator. Thank you for a very interesting talk. I had a question about inspiratory and expiratory muscle training um, and um, the any potential research or evidence that you might know with regards to it. Um, yes. Um, so I, like I said, I'm updating my slides. Um, I know that uh, the group out of uh, Cleveland has been doing work in this area for some time. Um, and um, they are actually using uh, abdominal muscle stimulation, functional electrical stimulation, as well as epidural stimulation to activate um, uh, individuals um, ability to e exhale, particularly to generate cough. Um, there's inspiration uh, uh, muscle training that has been provided by uh, Dr. Annie Palermo, who's uh, down under for the next year or so that may join us in the near future. Uh, she uh, worked with our group of physical therapists and, and Dr. Nash uh, to improve. Um, inspiratory muscle training does in fact uh, help. Uh, now, that said, uh, as I look through the literature, I don't see how many of these folks were using uh, abdominal binders uh, during or um, prior to the inspiratory muscle training. So I think that my caveat on all of this is we need to see how effective can we be simply by using the abdominal binders. Um, and then in using those, will that also help to improve our inspiratory muscle training um, and, and strengthening? Um, I know that we have a couple of therapists here, a speech language therapist and a physical therapist who are looking at some inspiratory training. Um, and so more to come. Good question. 
and Dr. Fiazzo. Yes, thank you for the lecture. I really enjoyed it. Uh, my question is for uh, able-bodied individuals, those, for example, who have fractured ribs, so as a result, low tidal volume, et cetera, how much of these complications that you talked about um, may apply to them and they are susceptible to? Yes, they're susceptible. Uh, yeah. Having, yeah. having had cracked ribs myself, I could, I could also speak to that. Uh, it hurts when you breathe. Mm -hmm. um, it hurts when you cough. It hurts when you sneeze. Um, and so because of that, they're going to be at much higher risk for atelectasis and pneumonia, mm -hmm. um, and, which is why that, um, you know, trauma patients routinely uh, get the uh, inspiratory uh, device, uh, and we try to have them do that 10 times at least uh, every hour uh, to try to continue to expand the alveoli so that they're at lower risk for atelectasis and pneumonia. But absolutely, you're right. And our per persons with spinal cord injury, hard to say. Uh, level of the injury may um, uh, may be such that they don't even feel uh, pain as they're taking those breaths. Uh, but if their level of injury is that high, then they're going to end up having uh, li high likelihood of atelectasis pneumonia anyway. Those with thoracic injuries, definitely a problem. Um, and one of those things that we continue to try to manage um, while they're on the ventilator and get off of it. Thank you. Great. Thanks all. Uh, everybody again, have a wonderful new year. Uh, next time I give this lecture, I'll have a few more slides with some updated um, uh, literature to support those. So have a great day. See you soon.